The right to a fair trial and due process of law is universally acknowledged. It's been recognised for centuries as a core value, a key principle of civilised society, a fundamental human right. Each of us looks to the law to protect what we hold most dear, our life and our liberty. When the well of justice is poisoned, some of us may die and all of us suffer. Justice should be objective and impartial administered without fear or favour, regardless of identity, money, power or weakness. Since the 15th century, the figure of justice has been portrayed blindfold to symbolise impartiality. Just as her scales represent the fair weighing of evidence. These are principles we ignore at our peril. Eleanor Roosevelt once famously said, Justice cannot be for one side alone, but must be for both. Ironically, it's American political influence that has done much to unfairly weight that balance and pollute the process of international justice. The 3,175th meeting of the Security Council is called to order. In 1993, the UN Security Council, urged on by the United States and its NATO allies, established the International Criminal Court for the former Yugoslavia, the ICTY. The rationale was that state sovereignty provided a cover for dictators to wield unfettered power. Therefore, a supranational body was needed with powers to step in, take control and restore order. The argument may be seductive, but it's specious, because it may simply allow the international community or even a superpower to impose its will instead. If that were the case, then who on earth could constrain a global force like the UN? A self-empowered ad hoc court, the ICTY was part of a new world order determined to treat what was clearly a civil war in Yugoslavia as a threat to international peace and security. In doing so, it overrode the principle enshrined in the UN's own charter, namely that states are sovereign within their own borders. The power to prosecute criminals is one of the key attributes of state sovereignty. The supranational imposition of justice destroys the link between a sovereign power and its people, abolishing ties of history, tradition, language and culture. The judges at the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunal in 1945 were careful to explain that their right to judge the Nazis only flowed from the unconditional surrender of the Germans, which meant there was literally no German government in Germany. It was the Allied powers who provisionally held supreme authority. This wasn't the case in Yugoslavia, which was still a functioning sovereign power. But a flood of grossly distorted reports in the Western media of war crimes and genocide on a massive scale understandably provoked a demand for retribution. The problem was that under its charter, the UN doesn't have and has never had any right or power to set up its own criminal tribunal. The ICTY was the ultimate anomaly, an illegal court. The considered opinion of former U.S. Attorney General Ramsey Clark is unequivocal. Examination of the history, background, drafting and approval of the UN Charter will convince everyone that there would never have been a United Nations if the five permanent members established in the Charter thought there was any possibility it could create a criminal court. A review of the UN Charter reveals that it grants no power to the Security Council or elsewhere to create a criminal court. It was deliberately denied any criminal jurisdiction. And yet create one it did. The tribunal was first suggested by the United States in the autumn of 1992. Originally its costs were to be borne by the UN, but it ended up being largely staffed and funded by the Americans. As it became clear how useful the court was in furthering U.S. policy objectives, its budget grew exponentially to a staggering $300 million a year. With NATO approaching its 50th anniversary and eager to celebrate and justify its post-Cold War existence, the scene was set for the U.S. to extend its sphere of influence in the Balkans. In the words of Clinton's national security advisor, Anthony Lake, Bosnia was the cancer eating away at US foreign policy, undermining American and NATO credibility abroad. Kosovo is often presented as the problem to which NATO was the solution. In truth, Kosovo was the solution to NATO's identity problem. The tribunal was more concerned with condemning political enemies than seeking justice. 
Not that you'd have guessed that from Madeleine Albright's soaring rhetoric at the inaugural session. Today we begin to cleanse the hatred that has torn apart the former Yugoslavia. A few months ago I said, this will be no victor's tribunal. The only victor that will prevail in this endeavor is the truth. Truth is the cornerstone of the rule of law and it will point towards individuals, not peoples, as perpetrators of war crimes. And it is only the truth that can cleanse the ethnic and religious hatreds and begin the healing process. The reality fell short on every count. The ICTY was demonstrably a victor's tribunal where truth did not prevail, due process was flouted and justice denied. The people of an entire nation were demonized as the greatest perpetrators of war crimes and genocide since Hitler and the Holocaust. Far from cleansing hatred and starting a healing process, the ICTY left an open running sore. It was rightly condemned as a rogue court with rigged rules, predicated on the monstrous lie that might is right. These harsh judgments are based not on prejudice or opinion, but firm evidence and hard fact. A key requirement for due process is that a defendant be tried by a body established by law. As we've seen, the Security Council isn't a lawmaking body. When accused during an early trial of being an illegal court, the tribunal didn't refer the allegation to another body, such as the International Court of Justice. It decided to deal with the charge itself. Unsurprisingly, it found in its own favour. The deeply rooted principle that no man be a judge in his own cause clearly did not apply to the ICTY. The legitimacy of the court was questionable from its conception. This was recognised by the UN Secretary General himself, who wrote at the time. Security Council Resolution 808, 1993, states that an international tribunal shall be established for the prosecution of persons responsible for serious violations of international humanitarian law committed in the territory of the former Yugoslavia since 1991. It does not, however, indicate how such an international tribunal is to be established, or on what legal basis. The approach which in the normal course of events would be followed in establishing an international tribunal would be the conclusion of a treaty by which the state's parties would establish a tribunal and approve its statute. This treaty would be drawn up and adopted by an appropriate international body, e.g. the General Assembly or an especially convened conference. But the normal treaty approach wasn't followed on the ground that, given the reported urgency and scale of the humanitarian crisis, it would take too long and not all countries would agree. So, instead of seeking a treaty, Chapter 7 of the UN Charter was invoked and used as justification. This states that an international tribunal would constitute a measure to maintain or restore international peace and security following the requisite determination of the existence of a threat to the peace, a breach of the peace or act of aggression. But as Canadian lawyer and former ICTY Defence Counsel Christopher Black explains, this very clear requisite determination could only be made by moving the goalposts. Chapter 7 of the UN Charter requires that there be a threat to the peace or an act of aggression before the Security Council can make use of its special powers set out in that chapter. It has always been interpreted to mean, and was meant to mean, a threat to international peace, not national peace. The members of the Security Council recognised this and so had to redefine a national problem as an international one. The warring parties in Yugoslavia, however, didn't pose a threat to international peace. They were focused on change within the territory of Yugoslavia. In reality, it was the international community that was focused on intervention in Yugoslavia for their own political ends. Numerous members of the Security Council, including China, Spain, Venezuela, Japan, the United Kingdom, New Zealand and Brazil, expressed unease over the creation of the ICTY under Chapter 7. It was only the apparent urgency of the humanitarian crisis that persuaded them to vote in favour. Regular refuelling of the escalating numbers of those killed was an integral feature of the Balkans conflict right from the beginning. It was calculated to inflame world opinion, provoke calls for international intervention and justify armed action. The origin of the figure of 200,000 dead in Bosnia in the first six months of war has since been traced back to its source, the Croatian Propaganda Ministry. A later allegation by the Bosnian Prime Minister Haris Selajic that 70,000 Bosnian Muslims had been massacred at Bihać made headlines around the world, 
but it was subsequently found to be totally untrue. At the outset of the final conflict, the Kosovo War in 1999, US Defence Secretary William Cohen claimed, We have now seen about 100,000 military-aged Albanian men missing. They may have been murdered. David Sheffer, the US ambassador at large for war crimes, put the potential number even higher, citing 225,000 ethnic Albanian men aged 14 to 59. The peak figure was positively stratospheric. According to the Boston Globe, the State Department reported that as many as 500,000 ethnic Albanian men are missing and may be victims of Serb genocide. No fewer than 100,000 Albanian men are unaccounted for and may be lying in mass graves throughout the separatist province. In fact, there were relatively few periods of intense fighting in the Bosnian War. Even basic research would have shown the improbability of 200,000 deaths in the first six months of fighting. British military losses during six years of World War II totaled 383,700. UK civilian losses were 67,200, and this included the London Blitz, the bombing of Coventry and other cities, and the intense fighting in the Far East. George Kenney, the acting head of the Yugoslav desk in the US State Department in 1992, had access to all military information. He knew that the figures put out officially and publicised widely were a fiction, and said so. The news media's fundamental pervasive lie has been to report uncritically, in lockstep, wildly inflated death statistics provided by the Bosnian government. This stirred up a massive public outcry, in turn ultimately leading to formal charges of genocide being rendered against the Bosnian Serbs. But there has never been a shred of evidence, none at all, for repeated claims that 200,000 or more people, mostly Muslims, were killed. The most recent statistic put out by the ICTY in 2007 cuts that figure in half, with a revised figure for all deaths from all sides down to around 100,000. The Security Council was no doubt convinced that in the particular circumstances of the former Yugoslavia, an international tribunal would put an end to barbaric crimes. But as it turned out, those particular circumstances were hugely exaggerated. When it came to indictments, the court was brazenly biased in deciding whom to prosecute. 80% of those indicted were Serbs. And yet all sides were implicated in war crimes, not least NATO, with its 78-day bombing campaign in Kosovo. But that was a war crime the court steadfastly ignored. Despite the fact that NATO broke nearly every rule of war, deploying cluster bombs against civilians, targeting shops, schools and hospitals, it did so with impunity. Only 2% of its precision-guided missiles hit military targets. Its intensive bombing was intended to destroy the Yugoslav economy. NATO committed the ultimate crime of waging a war of aggression. The United Nations Charter, Article 2, prohibits interventions in the domestic jurisdiction of any country and threats of force or the use of force by one state against another. To characterize the bombing of Kosovo as humanitarian intervention is grotesque. Asked whether NATO leaders could ever be indicted by the International Tribunal, the Alliance's spokesman, Jamie Shea, responded, As you know, without NATO countries there would be no International Court of Justice, nor would there be any International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Because NATO countries are in the forefront of those who have established these two tribunals, who fund these tribunals, and who support on a daily basis their activities. We are the upholders, not violators of international law. Walter J. Rockler, one of the Nuremberg prosecutors and co-author of the Nuremberg Principles, declared that the NATO bombing of Yugoslavia constituted the most brazen international aggression since the Nazis invaded Poland. NATO delivered a non-negotiable ultimatum to the effect that Kosovo must be turned over to NATO rule with a view to ultimate Albanian independence of the province. The ultimatum was backed by a threat to pound Yugoslavia into submission. The Yugoslav government rejected the NATO proposal, with the result that NATO was allegedly forced, for, quote, humanitarian reasons, unquote, to carry out its bombing threat. This resulted in ceaseless day and night bombing 
with an estimated 14,000 sorties over almost three months. Using smart bombs, dumb bombs, cluster bombs, and bombs incorporating depleted uranium, the bombings in the service of humanitarianism killed more than a thousand men, women, and children. It struck factories, waterworks, electric work, TV and radio facilities, bridges, trains, and ordinary houses, to say nothing of the Chinese embassy. Rockler told the American press the NATO action violates and shreds the basic provisions of the United Nations Charter and other conventions and treaties. UN Resolution 2131 declares a forceful military intervention in any country to be aggression and a crime without justification, and yet the tribunal failed to call NATO to account. The tribunal was itself complicit in NATO killings. Indictees could be shot dead by NATO hit squads for resisting arrest, even though they had no idea they were being sought to stand trial. They were the subjects of secret or sealed indictments, the contents of which weren't made public. Such indictments, issued routinely by the ICTY, were intended to reduce the risk of flight, but they also removed any possibility of voluntary surrender. Sinisa Giuliazza witnessed his father's fatal encounter with NATO. Suddenly, six heavily armed men sprang out of nowhere and ordered us to keep calm, to lay with our heads on the ground and not to resist. I obeyed and so did my uncle. At that time, three soldiers jumped on my father. He shook all three off and attempted to flee. The soldiers shot at him and my father fell on the ground. He was not dead. I heard him breathing. Then a soldier came up to him and shot him point blank in the head. For those crimes the tribunal did prosecute, the court's conduct showed a shocking disregard for the very thing which distinguishes the rule of law from retribution, namely due process. These are just some of the worst abuses. The tribunal failed to adopt best practice and wasn't objective, fair and impartial at all times. It ignored strict instructions from the Security Council to only implement existing international law. It created new laws criminalizing actions retrospectively. The court had no definition of the burden of proof required for a conviction, such as beyond reasonable doubt. There was no right to bail or a speedy trial. There was no trial by jury. Verdicts were reached by a team of three judges who also heard appeals and resolved legal questions about trial procedure. In practice, the ICTY was judge and jury in its own cause. Many of the judges had little or no courtroom experience. They were academics, diplomats, or from a political background. The tribunal created a new hybrid of the adversarial and inquisitorial legal systems, which greatly reduced the basic rights of defendants. This was condemned at the time by Sir Howard Morrison, QC, a former ICTY trial judge, now president of the Appeals Division of the International Criminal Court. Some of the limitations imposed on the defence run counter to the idea of any level playing field as between the defence and the prosecution, and strike at the very heart of professional effective representation. The defence were regularly denied full access to all the evidence. This meant they were unable to call their own expert witnesses to test and challenge the prosecution case and freely cross-examine key witnesses. Defendants were often ignorant of the charges and testimony against them. Some were tried in absentia. It was decided that in cases of rape or sex crimes, no corroboration of the victim's testimony would be required. Defendants were exposed to double jeopardy. The court scrapped the long-held principle that no one may be tried twice for the same crime. Article 25 of the Tribunal's statute gives the prosecutor the right to appeal an acquittal and obtain a conviction. Hearsay evidence and secret testimony were admitted, sometimes from witnesses who were dead. Best legal practice would never have allowed this. In English law, and again, I'm, I'm, I don't know other legal systems uh, very well, but I expect the same principles exist uh, elsewhere, certainly they should. Uh, you cannot, uh, in a criminal trial, say that, as, a, as if you're a witness for the prosecution, that you heard someone say that so-and-so did something. That is hearsay evidence, that's simply not admissible. If you say it, the judge will stop you 
uh, and and or the, def the 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 defence will say this is not admissible. You're simply not allowed to say it because it is irrelevant. It cannot. It's it's irrelevant. Why? Because it cannot be tested in court. If a witness says he heard his friend say so and so did it, that uh, is of, uh, totally useless to the court because the court cannot bring or has not brought the person who is alleged to have to have this knowledge. A, court, a trial is like a scientific experiment. It has to be conducted in controlled circumstances. All uh, external uh, influences must be removed from the laboratory when the experiment is conducted. Otherwise, the experiment will not be valid. The same is true of a criminal trial. Uh, and uh, hearsay evidence is an example of one of these external influences that has to be excluded if the scientific uh, nature of a trial is to be preserved because a trial is a, is a, is a laboratory in which testimony is tested as much as is possible. And yet academic studies reveal a huge reliance on hearsay evidence. In the Milosevic trial, 90% of the evidence was from hearsay sources. Sininian Stephen, an ICTY judge for four years, was deeply critical of the tribunal's use of anonymous or protected witnesses. The right to a fair administration of justice holds so prominent a place in democratic society that it cannot be sacrificed to expediency. If the defence is unaware of the identity of the person it seeks to question, it may be deprived of the very particulars enabling it to demonstrate that he or she is prejudiced, hostile or unreliable. The dangers inherent in such a situation are obvious. The conduct of the court was often hostile towards defendants. Slobodan Milosevic was interrupted by Judge Sir Richard May no less than 70 times during a highly effective cross-examination and often had his microphone cut off. The court machinery for investigation and evidence gathering had an inbuilt bias. The tribunal allowed its driving force to be the United States, which had armed and aided the Croatian and Bosnian Muslims from 1992 onwards. Former ICTY president Gabriel Kirk MacDonald told the US Supreme Court in 1999 that Madeleine Albright, the permanent representative to the UN, worked with unceasing resolve to establish the tribunal. Indeed, we often refer to her as the mother of the tribunal. Prosecution witnesses frequently complained that their official written statements didn't accurately reflect what they told investigators. Slobodan Milosevic, cross-examining witness Nikola Samjic about his statement, was told, I did not say that, whatever was written there. I did not put it that way. I am presenting here before the tribunal matters as I recall them. Now, if this were put into my mouth, I don't think that is in order. The most notorious example of fabricated evidence was exposed in the very first trial conducted by the ICTY, that of the Serb commander Dusko Tadic. The star prosecution witness, known only as Witness L, was about 20 years old, and he'd already been sentenced himself to 10 years for crimes of genocide and rape committed when he was a guard at the Trinopoli detention camp. He testified that he'd served under Tadic and saw him commit similar crimes. But on questioning, Witness L admitted he'd given false testimony. He said he'd neither written nor read his statement and only signed it after death threats from the Bosniak intelligence agency, which was desperate to convict the Serb defendant. Witness L said the Bosniaks beat him, coached him on what to say, and even took him to the scene of the alleged crimes so that he could describe them. All of it was a lie, he said, prearranged by the Federation and the tribunal investigators. If the court was having trouble finding evidence to support indictments already issued, it would simply rewrite the indictments to make the task easier. If it wanted to do something not allowed under its statute, it routinely amended its statute to provide the powers it needed. In 1993, the American Bar Association expressed no fewer than 150 general and specific concerns about the ICTY statute. They included the use of secret testimony and hearsay evidence, limitations on the rights of the accused to confront accusers, and the provision to allow appeals by prosecutors. The International Commission on Missing Persons, the agency set up to conduct exhumations and DNA identification, was established at the behest of the US President Bill Clinton. Its chairmen were exclusively American. More than 90% of the staff were Bosnian Muslims. Its most crucial forensic and DNA evidence was never made available to the court, 
far less the defendants and the defense teams. It was merely reported to the court and written into the record as established fact. It's clear from information now in the public domain that none of this apparent evidence would have survived the rigorous scrutiny of a proper trial. DNA is unquestionably useful in establishing the identity of missing persons, but quite useless as an evidentiary tool in determining genocide. This is because even a perfect match can't determine when, how or why someone died. This was confirmed by the ICMP's Director of Forensic Sciences, Thomas Parsons, under cross-examination by the Bosnian Serb President, Radovan Karadzic. Hvala, a da li vi znate da je ovde optužnica se odnosi na nezakonito ubijanje, odnosno egzekucije? Da li vi tvrdite da su ti ljudi čije ste DNK profile utvrdili poginuli na nezakonit način i da li ste odvojili one koji su poginuli u borbama? The ICMP does not concern itself with whether, with the legal question of, of how these people were killed or particularly with, with whether their, their deaths were lawful or not. I'm reporting on the identifications that have been made with regard to uh, mortal remains recovered from these graves. Now the ICMP has, has performed a great deal of work with regard to excavations of these sites uh, and, uh, and, and the evidence that was recovered there and much of which uh, is, has been covered in previous trials and as I understand it roughly also with regard to, to this, uh, there's a lot of evidence that, that um, goes to whether or not, to, to, to the circumstances under which these people lost their lives. But of course, the DNA matches themselves, don't indicate that. When the Karadzic defense team pressed to see the primary DNA evidence, the ICMP agreed to provide it for 300 cases. The defense requested DNA for five specific cases selected by Dr. Karadzic, and a further 295 cases which they chose as a perfect random sample. But at that point the ICMP said they couldn't do this because some of the relatives who'd given their DNA wouldn't agree for it to be handed over. Eventually DNA printouts were provided for the five cases chosen by Karadzic but the other 295 cases were selected by the ICMP. The defense team saw no point in reviewing this information because what was provided wasn't primary DNA evidence, it wasn't a random sample because the ICMP had made the final selection, and it provided no basis for any meaningful conclusions. Nevertheless, despite this fundamental denial of the defendant's right to see all the evidence against him, not just a tiny percentage, Catherine Bomberger, the Director General of the ICMP, sought to present this as evidence of the court's even-handedness. Da, da vidimo taj materijal, da vidimo DNK. The work that we did with Mr. Karadzic, who was mounting his own defense, where he wanted all the genetic reference samples related to Srebrenica, which were huge. I think the trial chamber in that case uh, ruled that we could you know, work with Mr. Karadzic, that he could select 300 cases himself randomly, which he did. And we went back to 1,500 families of the missing, because remember we had to have three reference sample per missing person, to see if they would be willing to provide their genetic information to the alleged perpetrator. So we were able to do that. We met the needs of the defense in these cases. And in each one of these cases, there was irrefutable evidence regarding the identity of this person. Professor Oliver Sojkovic, the independent DNA expert appointed by the court to the Karadzic defense team, has confirmed that none of the sample material handed over to him was of any probative value. He was unable to conduct any tests because there was no physical evidence, such as blood or bone, to examine merely DNA profiles on paper, essentially printouts confirming what had already been reported to the court with no explanation of how the results were achieved. Without full access to all the original tissue samples for independent testing and analysis, 
there was literally no way the ICMP findings could be either challenged or verified. At present, one can't claim with certainty that the ICMP is lying about the DNA identification of Srebrenica massacre victims, but nor can anyone claim with certainty that they're telling the truth. Only the ICMP has the power to end that uncertainty, and yet persistently refuses to do so. This can only heighten suspicion that there is something to hide. We now know that deliberate steps had been taken in 1998 to ensure that the ICMP was above and beyond the law and could never be held to account. In fact, there was never the remotest possibility that its crucial scientific evidence would be made available for independent scrutiny. Research in 2017 by the International Association of Genocide Scholars revealed the ICMP had been granted extraordinary and unprecedented immunity in a deal with the governments of Croatia and Muslim Bosnia. The headquarters agreement between the Commission and the Council of Ministers of Bosnia-Herzegovina gave the ICMP the status of an intergovernmental organization. Article 3 granted the ICMP immunity from every form of legal and administrative process. Article 4 stated, The premises of the ICMP shall be inviolable. The property and assets of the ICMP shall be immune from search, requisition, confiscation, expropriation and any other form of interference, whether by executive, judicial, administrative or legislative action. Only a decision by the ICMP itself to waive these immunities could render it accountable. Thus, the age-old legal principle, be you never so high, the law is above you, was cynically sidelined. The shocking fact remains that the court admitted as core evidential material findings that were totally unsupported by any solid physical evidence, and yet despite that, went on to convict defendants. 21 years on, it is still the case that the DNA used to identify claimed 6,800 bodies has never been properly shared with anyone, not even the DNA community. Given that DNA methodologies are highly complex with huge operational problems such as contamination, there is effectively no hard evidence of any kind to support the identifications made by the ICMP or the many genocide verdicts handed down by the ICTY. It follows that none of these verdicts is safe. The evidence of genocide is as non-existent as the evidence for Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. The ICTY's struggle for evidence to support its indictments and the need to speed up the glacial trial process led to a rapid increase in plea bargaining. Encouraging defendants to cooperate in return for a lighter sentence or better treatment can put them under a degree of duress now categorised as torture by the United Nations, and it may not serve the course of justice. It's often easier to say what's required than simply tell the truth. The ICTY star witness, Drajan Ademovic, a self-confessed killer, was a prime example. A Croatian mercenary who'd fought on all sides in the Civil War, he was initially judged mentally unfit to stand trial. Yet despite his certified mental instability, the tribunal chose to use him as the key prosecution witness in numerous high-profile cases, including those of Milosevic and Mladic. Ademovic had confessed to killing at least 70 Muslims in Srebrenica. He claimed to be one of an eight-man execution squad that shot dead 1,200 Muslim men in cold blood in the space of just five hours. But Ademovic had done a deal with the court. He was sentenced to a mere five years and only served three and a half. Incredibly, the entire case for genocide was largely constructed on the confused and contradictory testimony of this one highly unstable individual. During the Milosevic case, his written statement that men of all ethnicities had taken part was challenged by the defendant. When Milosevic asked him directly whether he'd seen or heard Serbians at the time of the shootings, Ademovic admitted that he hadn't. His self-serving version of events was never corroborated by the ICTY, whose search for the truth stopped short of seeking out his seven accomplice killers. Even though their names and addresses were public knowledge from 1997, unaccountably the tribunal made no attempt to bring them to justice before it stopped accepting new cases in 2004. Despite formal instructions to confine itself to implementing existing international law, 
the tribunal created new laws. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres boasted about it at the ICTY closing party. Ladies and gentlemen, the International Criminal, Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia has been a pioneer in creating the contemporary architecture of international criminal justice. There's been more jurisprudence out of our tribunal in five years than in the past 500 years from international criminal courts. The ICTY changed existing humanitarian law by inventing new crimes, such as Joint Criminal Enterprise, or JCE. This meant defendants found themselves being charged with crimes that weren't designated as crimes at the time they were allegedly committed. One critic claimed JCE really stood for just convict everyone. The ICTY abandoned the previously inviolable principles of modern law that defendants should have the right to present their own case. Stephen Kay QC, one of three lawyers appointed by the court to represent the Yugoslav president Slobodan Milosevic against his wishes, argued powerfully but in vain against this injustice. And in the context of a trial and a defendant, one cannot think of anything more fundamental, more going to the interests of justice, more going to the fairness of a trial than that that concerns the right to present your defence as you want it, rather than how somebody else wants it to be presented. To sum up, the ICTY was an ad hoc court whose very existence was in violation of international law. It wasn't established by the normal process of a treaty agreed by individual countries, and illegal conduct by the UN endangers all society, as there is no ready means of restraining it. The ICTY was neither fair nor objective. It stands accused of being a political tool created to secure convictions. Its findings had no credibility as the tribunal was judge in its own cause. Some of the incidents revealed an almost medieval savagery and a calculated cruelty that went far beyond the bounds of legitimate welfare. The court's conflict of interest couldn't have been more stark. Sponsored and funded by the U.S. and NATO, the tribunal adjudicated on a war in which the U.S. and NATO were themselves active and direct participants, as U.S. envoy Richard Holbrook told the BBC. The War Crimes Tribunal was a huge, valuable tool. We used it to keep the two most wanted war criminals in Europe out of the Dayton process, and we used it to justify everything that followed. And the court was a willing tool. Tribunal President Antonio Cassese hailed the exclusion from Dayton a great political victory with diplomatic consequences. Another former president, Claude Yorda, called it a major contribution to international peace. It seems the world has fallen prey to the greatest of propaganda weapons, the big lie. A lesson from the Nazis that if you're going to lie, the bigger the lie the better, because more people will believe you. Hitler wrote of a lie so colossal that no one would believe that someone would have the impudence to distort the truth so infamously. The concept, of course, of an international tribunal fabricating evidence and inventing verdicts does beg a belief, and the global scale of that deception is truly mind-boggling. But sadly, the ICTY stands condemned by its own conduct. These tribunals are not, criminal, not institutions of criminal justice, as is portrayed in the mass media or by the tribunals themselves, but in fact are politically motivated courts whose purpose is one thing, propaganda. That the trials, the, the people targeted for the charges are carefully selected to represent certain segments of the regimes which have been overthrown in Yugoslavia and Rwanda, for instance. And they target certain leaders, political leaders, military personnel, intellectuals, and so on. And in my experience, from all the trials I've been involved with and have knowledge of, all the charges are politically based, by, uh, motivated. And the, re the, propaganda, the purpose of the propaganda aspect of it is that they're used, first of all, to demonize the old regime so it can't come back to power to put out a false picture of what actually happened in those wars and to cover up the real role of the West in those wars. The ICTY was a fraudulent court of law. 
that set out not to reveal the truth, but to conceal a carefully constructed lie, which it then relentlessly propagated for political purposes. It's clear that the scales of justice weighed not only the evidence of genocide, but also the influence of geopolitics. The verdict on the tribunal, based on the evidence and beyond reasonable doubt, is guilty as charged. The ICTY wasn't even victor's justice. It was no justice at all. The lasting legacy of the ICTY is a seemingly indelible lie, a monumental myth, the still widely held but false notion that the Serbs were genocidal killers. This distortion only became the authorised version of historical reality because a rogue court misused its powers for political ends and abused its moral authority. The evidence on the ground of what occurred in Yugoslavia shows that there were isolated incidents of mass killing. They were carried out by all sides, but lacked the scale and intent required to constitute genocide as defined by the 1948 Geneva Convention. That's why the tribunal's charges of genocide, predominantly against Serbs, weren't made under the Convention, but under Article 4 of the Court Statute. This adopted the same text and definition of genocide, but ignored its original context, thus enabling the Court to interpret the law rather than just apply it. The crime of genocide, as defined by the Convention, requires the unique mental element of specific intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial or religious group. The killing of Muslim men of military age in Srebrenica to remove a future military threat didn't readily fit those criteria. The victims did not obviously form part of the protected group specified in the Convention. So, to make the charge of genocide stick, the tribunal had to redefine the crime. The specific intent required was never established, nor was evidence produced of the necessary scale of deaths. Indictments for genocide were issued before the facts could be known, and years after sentences were handed down, the evidence on which they were supposedly based was still being sought. Sadly, a major legacy of the ICTY is that the standards of court procedure it applied now threaten to corrupt judicial standards around the world. Those with the military might to set up and control tribunals will find it easier in future to use the accusation of genocide to justify its so-called humanitarian military aggression against nations merely defending their sovereignty. The ICTY's contravention of UN core values and its contempt for established legal principles betrayed the best standards of civilization and the trust of the world. On the face of it, no cause could have been more noble than the ICTY's mission to end impunity for the perpetrators of genocide, however powerful they may be. The humanitarian appeal was overwhelming, but there is no better cover for base ambition than a noble cause. It gave the United States the perfect pretext for international intervention with the full blessing of the UN. Today we focused on the situation in Kosovo. Progress at the Rambouillet talks is slow, far too slow. It is clear that if extremists on either side succeed in blocking a settlement, the result will be more death and destruction for the innocent people of Kosovo. But demonizing the Serbs was always the main objective. This CIA memo on the former Yugoslavia, dated 1993, clearly states the US policy option to establish a war crimes tribunal to publicize Serbian atrocities, and openly admits that treating Bosnian transgressions would be regarded as tilting in Belgrade's favor. Throughout its existence, the tribunal was manipulated by the US. It protected American interests, promoted American aims, and projected American power while enabling the U.S. to pose as guardians of international law and order. I, uh, I can't, I, I'm still overwhelmed by the horror of this and that it's possible for people uh, to behave this way towards fellow human beings. The consequences were catastrophic, fanning the flames of ancient rivalries.
conflicts were intensified, igniting wars that need never have happened. The fighting in Bosnia and Croatia that could have ended in 1992 dragged on for a further three years. There was a war in Kosovo that could have been completely avoided, and all in the name of humanitarianism. At every turn, the ICTY aided and abetted the disastrous policies of the New World Order. It betrayed the global trust and confidence in international law and made a pariah of an entire people. Only the court of public opinion can begin to remedy such gross injustice.